everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my channel. Today I want to address some common concerns when it comes to costuming for plus size people. Over the last couple of weeks, I have been asking all of you for any questions that you might have regarding costuming and sewing for plus size bodies, so I'm going to try to address all of your questions here today. Thank you all so much for sending me your questions, by the way. That was fantastic. And if you didn't already send in a question, please do comment below with any additional questions, and if I get enough of them, I will go ahead and make another one of these videos later. Also, if you are interested in learning more about plus size costuming and sewing, I do already have several other videos on this topic, so I will leave a link to that playlist up here above and down below in the description. For now though, let's get on with your questions. A couple of notes here. First, I've left all of these questions anonymous since I wasn't sure if you all wanted me to share your names or not. And second, I have tried to group them in sections according to topic, and I will try to put timestamps on that to match down below in the description. So let's start with the topic of proportion. Our first question is asking where I seek inspiration and how I see through the plates or pictures as presented to know that they can also look fabulous on me and my body type. Now, unfortunately, just like looking through the pages of fashion magazines nowadays, fashion plates tend to show a very idealized and often impossible figure. And I think that latter bit is really important to keep in mind. Often impossible. Women of those times did not actually look like these fashion plates. The proportions are often more like a strangely shaped Barbie doll than anything else. So it doesn't really matter what your body looks like because it's almost certainly not going to match the fashion plate. And honestly, the same can be said for paintings and even a lot of photography as well. Paintings are often idealized and pictures can be photoshopped or their version of photoshop no matter how old they are. I think that knowing that helps to realize that those fashions can look amazing on you no matter what your body type is. In certain eras, padding out your figure to really help you achieve those curves, whether that's with actual pads or through the use of bustles, peignets, hoops, etc., will help you come closer to that idealized proportion. But Basically, when I'm choosing something that I want to emulate, I completely look past the figure. For me, it's about the fabrics, the decorations, etc., and I just look past the body that they're drawn on. What will make you happy to wear? If you find a plate or a painting or a photo that you love and that you would feel really happy wearing, then make it and wear it. It really doesn't matter what your own actual figure is like. Similarly, I had questions regarding how to compensate for non-standard shaping rather than sizing to still get the desired silhouette, and like I just mentioned, that is all about padding. You can pad out your hips and bum or your bust in order to achieve the more historical silhouette. They did it then, too. So, going off the topic of padding, the next question is about what to do if you don't have much waist to hip ratio and how to build the padding into your corsets or stays so that you can build out your hips and make your skirts hang better. There's a couple of different options here. The easiest and most versatile option, I would say, is just to use hip or bum padding that ties around your waist. Really, you could put this either underneath or over your corset. If you put it underneath, you will need to make sure that your corset is built to accommodate the extra padding, but most likely it will be a bit more secure and it won't really have a chance to like twist around your body with the movement of your skirt or petticoat. If you put it over your corset, you won't have to worry about building your corset to fit the padding, but there is a small chance that it could twist a little bit. Another option would be to take super similar shapes of padding and instead of tying it around your waist, you could actually whip stitch the pads right into the interior of the corset. You will have to be a little careful about the padding that's right in the center back since it could be affected by your lacing gap, but whipping it in will ensure that it can't slip or fall anywhere else as well. Again, I would do this just as if you're making a separate pad, making little pillows out of cotton and then whatever stuffing you prefer inside, and just whipping these pillows into place within your corset. 
Next, let's address sort of the opposite question of how do you make things look proportional when your hips are a much larger size than your bust and your waist? Honestly, if your hips are larger in proportion than the rest of your body, that's kind of the easiest place to be in body shape wise, other than a true hourglass. In most historical silhouettes, your hips are left free. And the majority of those that are slightly more fitted around the hips, say like in the 1900s or the natural form bustle era, they would actually pad out their hips in order to get those sort of proportions that you already have. The only two eras, historically speaking, where I would think you'd run into maybe any trouble might be the 19 teens or the Regency era. For the 19 teens, you could wear a bust improver with your long line corset, and that will help to enhance your bust, and then that corset will slightly smooth your hips. For the Regency, I would honestly not worry about it anyway. It's such a columnar era, but your corset is going to help bring out your bust, because it's like a shelf, and then just make sure that when you're cutting your skirts, that you grade out your pattern from your waist to your hips, so that you know that your dress will fit comfortably. Likewise, for those of you with a large waist to stomach ratio, or even those of you with shorter torso and large hips, your grading is just going to be more extreme as you will have less length in which to grade out between your pattern sizes. It's still totally doable though, and for those of you that are unfamiliar, I will talk more about grading in a little bit when we get to the sewing and patterning section of this video. The next person wrote, how do you make corsets and stays work when you have a bee belly and one part of the bee is bigger than the other? They said that every time they wear a corset, they end up with a pretty big gap between the fabric of the corset and the lower half of their belly because the top half sticks out so much further. And honestly, it is totally okay to have that gap in the lower part of your corset. You want to make sure that the corset is nice and fitted at your natural waist because your skirt will be fitted at the natural waist and then it will fall away from your body, your skirt and your corset, so it doesn't really matter what's going on below your waist. In fact, historically speaking, a lot of corsets in various eras are actually meant to be larger than your measurements below your natural waist. In particular, in the 1860s and in the early 1900s, there should be extra room in the lower part of your corset, so it really shouldn't constrict you there at all. I did have one other person specify that their natural waist falls between the two tiers of their stomach, with the upper tier larger than the lower tier again, and they were wondering how to make adjustments to patterns to best fit that. It's definitely going to be more difficult to adjust things if your natural waist is actually between, but I would probably consider your upper tier a bit like a large rib cage area. You're going to have to do a lot of pattern grading and mock-ups for times when you're not wearing a corset because a corset should help to smooth out those layers quite a bit, so you may actually find that historical sewing is easier than modern sewing, but for the time being, heavily grading between sizes and doing a lot of mock-ups in the hopes of creating a basic bodice block should probably be your main focus for fitting. Let's follow this up with a slightly more general fit question applying to non-historical styles. This person asked, how do you make clothes look flattering on a plus size body? Does it require something like a corset or a Spanx underneath to smooth out everything? Is it just about hitting aspects of your body in the correct areas? First off, I think the term flattering isn't maybe the best to use here because everyone has different opinions on what might be flattering on various people. And frankly, you should be wearing clothes that you feel beautiful in and that you feel flatter yourself because clothing is for you, not for other people. So personally, I feel most beautiful in clothes that nip in at my natural waist, are very full at the bottom, and are comfortable on top, which tends to mean either blousey tops made of non-stretch fabrics or soft and comfy tops like sweaters or other knitwear. Personally, for non-historical styles, I do not believe in shapewear. <laughs> I wear cotton leggings, which I cut off above the knee, a regular modern bra and a cotton camisole because those are comfortable for me. And in winter, I add 120 denier, denier, however that word is pronounced, tights. Not the kind with compression or control top or anything like that, just comfy stretchy ones from Target. 
Now, that said, if you feel more beautiful wearing a corset or Spanx underneath your clothing, then go for it. But for me, I will usually add a wide stretchy belt to emphasize my waist or a wide sash, and frankly, that's all I need to feel flattering and beautiful. The next person wrote, is there any particular historical period that has fashion that looks good on people that do not have a small waist or don't have much of a difference between bust waist and hip measurements? They said that they know they used padding, but can't quite find examples of large rectangular body shapes to reference. They were also wondering which historical silhouette is easier to achieve for various body shapes. I really want to reinforce here that it does not matter what your body shape is. In every era, there were people of all body shapes. Padding and undergarments are your friend, and they will help you achieve at least something resembling the desired silhouette in any era. If you're looking for inspiration, though, I have assembled a Pinterest board of plus-size women in old photos and paintings. There are all sorts of women in these pictures, in all sorts of body shapes, so definitely go check out that Pinterest board if it helps to see that there have always been people who look just like you. It's linked down in the description if you want to check that out. I've also done a video where I focused in on achieving the desired silhouette for all sorts of eras, so I will link that video down in the description as well. The next person asked, when one's quarantine 20 landed mostly on the belly, what is the best way to adjust a pattern that fits across the chest and hips? This person said that they are not currently corseting and that the lines look wrong. <sighs> Honestly, if we are talking about historical costumes, you are just not going to look right without a corset. Foundations are everything. So for historical styles, you need to start with the proper foundation of that era, or at least one that is close to the proper foundation. Like you can get away with wearing an 1840s corset for the 1900s, but even if you try to wear an 1880s corset, say for the 1780s, you're going to look wrong. And wearing no corset at all will really never look any better than like costume as opposed to clothing. I actually have a whole video on the importance of proper undergarments under your historical costumes, so I will link that video up here and down below in the description. Next up, I was asked what recommendations I can share for fitting pants on plus size people or people that are not traditionally proportioned. And I wish that I could help you with this question, but as you may have noticed, I don't wear pants. I don't find them particularly comfortable or flattering on me, so I've removed them from my wardrobe. But maybe some of you can help to answer this question down in the comments? Now let's move on to some more sewing specific questions, including questions on patterning, alterations, measuring yourself, and more. First, this had to be the most asked question because I got this or really similar versions of this from a whole bunch of you. And that is, what patterns do I recommend for plus size people? Now I don't have a ton of experience with a lot of pattern companies outside the big three, Simplicity, McCall's, Butterick, etc. And those ones are generally not plus size friendly. But the four historical costuming pattern companies that I've used that are great for a wide range of sizes are Truly Victorian, Black Snail Patterns, Laughing Moon, and Scroop Patterns. All of these can be purchased pre-printed, or you can also get digital versions of the patterns and print them yourself. And I have linked all of the websites for those pattern companies down below. Truly Victorian goes up to a 46 inch waist and has patterns from the 1830s through the 19 teens, including corsets, undergarments, dresses, bodices, and even menswear. Black Snail Patterns goes up to a 47 inch waist and has patterns from the 18th century through the 19 teens, also including some corsets and some menswear, in addition to gowns, outerwear, and all sorts of other garments. Laughing Moon goes up to a 50 inch waist and has a really wide variety of patterns, less concentrated in any one era, though personally I really like their Regency patterns, but they're kind of scattered everywhere from the 18th century through the 1940s, including quite a bit of menswear. And lastly, though I've only used one screw pattern so far, some of the screw patterns do go up to a 50 inch waist, though unfortunately many of their patterns do top out smaller than that, more around the like 42, 44, 46 inch waist size. 
I'm thinking about trying their Augusta Stays pattern soon, and I have had some requests from you guys about potentially doing a sew along for something like that, so I will let you know if that sew along happens and if I decide to choose that pattern and how it goes. Next, how do you measure yourself for a corset or stays? What modern underpinnings should you have on when taking your measurements for corset or stays? Like, should you measure yourself with your regular everyday bra on or not? And the answer is yes. When making structured underlayers like corsets or stays, I always measure myself in a well-fitted bra because in a corset, your boobs will also be lifted. <laughs> Just make sure it's not a padded bra or like a sports bra. You just want a regular bra. Beyond that, I would recommend wearing something like a camisole and bike shorts or your chemise if you've already made one. The next question wants to know if I use a special technique to enlarge or reduce patterns, both for gridded patterns or for printed patterns. And I actually have a couple of videos on these subjects already, and I plan to make another video fairly soon as well. I have a video already about how to enlarge commercial patterns, such as those from Simplicity, Butterick, etc., and another on how to enlarge gridded patterns to your size. That video mostly focuses on skirts. I am planning to make one that focuses more on enlarging gridded corset or bodice patterns soon, too. That will probably come out around when I start making my 18th century Brunswick, so do make sure that you are subscribed and that you have clicked the little notification bell so that you know when that video comes out. I was also asked what other tips, tricks, and lessons I've learned regarding stay or corset making. My number one tip is to make sure that you bone your mock-up. The boning channels don't have to be super secure, but you definitely want bones in there. I've even actually duct taped my bones in, which while it does do okay for the structure of the mock-up, it can leave a sticky residue on your bones, so it may not have been the best idea. <laughs> Also, I recommend making lacing strips so that you can just sew in and rip out the lacing strips and not have to worry about actually putting in grommets every time you want to make a corset. Noelle from Costuming Drama has a great video on how to make these lacing strips, so I will link her video down below. I've also mentioned this in other sewing videos, but when you are mocking up your corset or bodice, it is likely that your mock-up will stretch a bit on you. So after making your adjustments, don't just return to the paper pattern. Instead, use your mock-up as your pattern. Particularly for corset making, it's likely that your final corset won't stretch like your mock-up did, so you want to make sure that any stretch that you utilized in your mock-up is already built in when you cut out your final corset pieces. Next up, this person wrote, the area above my bust often gapes, like I need a center front seam right there, but I don't want a seam right there. Similarly, the center back at the shoulder blades is too big. This sounds really familiar because this sounds like my exact problem. And unfortunately, I don't have an exact answer for you. A lot of you have said that I can fix this by doing a full bust adjustment, but I have now attempted a full bust adjustment multiple times and been completely unsuccessful. My solution to the over the bust gaping so far has been to play with the darts and the arms eye angles. If I'm remembering correctly, my most successful trial with this came last fall and I want to say it was maybe the plaid jumper dress, but I could be wrong, where I literally pivoted the bodice pieces in so that the waist wound up wider but could be altered back down with darts and the portion above the bust wound up smaller. For the back, I pretty much always have a center back seam or opening and I just make it taper in smaller from my mid back where it's largest to the neck. However, I'm sure that if you want to avoid the seam, you could try that same pivoting technique on the back that I mentioned on the front and pivot your pattern pieces in towards the top of the neck, increasing the dart size at the waist. Next up is how to alter a pattern when your bust, waist, and hip measurements are different sizes based on the pattern company's size chart. And the answer is that you can taper your pattern pieces in or out to different sizes. Truly Victorian patterns do a great job of explaining this in their instructions, but basically if your bust is a size 20 but your waist is a size 24, you can just taper your cut lines from one pattern size to the other. I would do this sort of tapering even before you make your first mock-up. 
A specific and similar question was asked about fitting corsets when your bust is smaller, and again, you just want to grade or taper your pattern in at the bust. Keeping in mind that with a gusseted corset, you will likely be making those gussets a fair bit smaller as well. Just as usual, always make sure you make a mock-up. Similarly, one of you asked what to do with bodice patterns when your bust is a smaller size than everywhere else and you are short-waisted, and they said that they were having a particularly hard time getting the darts right. So, like I just mentioned, you would want to start with adjusting your pattern so that you're tapering from a smaller bust size to a larger size everywhere else. If you are also short-waisted, this could wind up making your pattern fairly straight, removing a lot of the curves. The darts would also most likely be smaller than they originally were in the pattern. When making your mock-up, I would recommend sewing all of your side seams, back seams, etc. together, putting on the bodice, and then pinning your darts in place while you wear the bodice, put it on inside out, I would say, and just ignore the dart lines on your pattern entirely, since they almost certainly won't fit you correctly. Next, one of you told me that you've been intimidated by sizing up and altering patterns to fit your larger bust, and it has kept you from making the clothes that you want. This sounds like, potentially, another instance for a full bust adjustment, so I totally get that that may be super intimidating since, as you know, I have really struggled with that. One option that you could do, though, is that there are some patterns that actually come in different bust cup sizes, even within the big three pattern companies. You may also want to start with things like princess seams, as they can actually be pretty forgiving for a larger bust, though princess seam patterns don't really apply to much of historical costuming, just to let you know, since you don't really see princess seams come in until the later 1800s, so that's something to keep in mind if you're going for historical. Back to the topic of grading, I received a couple of questions regarding choosing the correct spot to start your grading between sizes. Generally speaking, I will literally just grade from the largest point to the smallest point, such as starting at the small part of your waist and then ending with the largest part of your hips or of your bust. That said, if you have a particularly large or small rib cage or a high upper hip, you will also want to take those measurements into account as well and compare your measurements in those places with those respective places on your pattern so that you can see if you need to taper in or out a little sooner or later to accommodate any differentiation in size there as well. And grading patterns is not just limited to bodices. I was asked how to adjust sleeves for a larger upper arm or biceps but a narrower forearm, and just like with bodices, you can actually just taper in or out between pattern sizes. Just measure your pattern in various places, since those measurements are never printed on your pattern, and see how large those parts of the sleeve are. Maybe your arm is a size 22 bicep, but a size 16 forearm, you can just taper it in from one to the other. I would recommend checking the measurements of your elbow and the pattern elbow too, just so that you don't accidentally taper that to be too large or too small. I know for me, the smaller tapering really starts to be necessary partway through my forearm, like around here, and then going all the way down to my wrist. But don't forget to leave your wrist opening large enough that you can still fit your hand through. I wound up receiving several questions from you guys regarding fabric requirements for plus size people, such as, is it true that when you're plus size you require twice as much fabric? And are the costs for fabric considerably higher for a plus size person than for non plus size people? And how much fabric should you buy when you're sizing up a pattern and can't rely on the pattern layouts or yardage requirements? So. Yes, there is at least some increase in the amount of fabric you need, depending on your size. However, in my own personal experience, it is far more dependent on your height than your width. Different patterns are drafted to different heights, so you do need to pay attention to whatever the finished length is of that particular pattern, which can vary from pattern to pattern even within one manufacturer. For example, I've heard that Angela Clayton's patterns for McCall's tend to run long, whereas American Duchess's patterns, though I think those are for simplicity, those run short. If the finished length on the envelope does not match the finished length that you need, make sure to adjust how much fabric you buy. As far as knowing how much more to buy, I find that I get set amounts depending on what the era is and whether or not you're going to be using self-trim. 
as in trim made out of the fabric. For example, if we look at an 1830s dress with piping but no other self-trim and with 55 inch wide fabric, I factor three widths of the fabric for the skirt, which at my length means a little under four yards total, plus one yard for each sleeve, one yard for the bodice, and one yard for the piping for a total of eight yards. If you're shorter, you can get away with a lot less because your skirt in particular is going to be a lot shorter. And frankly, even I could probably squeeze it out of seven yards, but that might mean piecing my piping or something like that. If you're working with something with self-trim, such as pleats or ruffles, your need for fabric will go way up. But in general, I find that your yardage requirement will be far more influenced by your height as opposed to your size. Let me know if you would be interested in a video where I basically break down every era and give an approximate fabric yardage requirement for a gown or even a couple of gowns of that era. For modern patterns, I tend to ignore a lot of the pattern specifications anyway, opting for things like gathered circle skirts and ruffles, which greatly increase how much fabric is needed. And as you can see in many of my videos, I frequently estimate this number wrong and wind up needing more fabric halfway through the project. A good rule of thumb is if you're going to do ruffles, buy a whole lot of extra fabric. <laughs> Now, elaborating on the extra yardage question, I had a few questions asking for any tips for buying or using fabric so that you don't go completely broke, or if there are any clever placements of pattern pieces in order to get the most out of what yardage you have. And uh, yeah, I completely ignore those pattern layout diagrams, particularly because once you do alter your patterns, they're going to change significantly. Honestly, you're just going to want to sort of Tetris your pieces in however they best fit, as long as you're still paying attention to the grain of your fabric. Of course, there are a couple of ways to get away with needing less fabric. For one, make sure you're not trying to match patterns in your fabric, such as plaids or stripes. For two, if you have a directional pattern, you're going to need more fabric so that you can make sure that all of your pieces are facing the same direction. If you really want to save on your fabric though, see if you can source a woven fabric that is the same weave on both front and back sides because then you can just flip your pieces around and like really Tetris them in there. Otherwise, my biggest recommendation is to plan ahead and shop sales. I actually have an entire video about costuming on a budget, so I will leave a link to that video up here and down in the description below. On the topic of patterning, I was asked what is more useful for plus size people, using and adapting commercial patterns or drafting patterns to your own measurements. And this is entirely personal preference. I do either one and sometimes both, <laughs> depending on the project. Generally, I will draft from something like a gridded pattern or I will size up commercial patterns. I don't tend to start completely from scratch. And either way, I adapt those patterns to suit what I'm going for with the project. I know we've talked about it on this channel and down in the comments before, but if you're able to draft yourself a couple of different bodice blocks, say like one princess seamed one and one darted bodice block, and have a set to fit your corseted measurements and then also a set to fit your uncorseted measurements, then that will be really helpful in the long run. Now for some slightly more miscellaneous questions, though this first question here, this was a very popular question as well. If your weight fluctuates pretty often, what can you do? And what eras would best allow for weight fluctuations? I think this depends a lot on your own weight distribution for one, because for example, I can lose 30 pounds and still have almost the exact same measurements, particularly if I'm wearing my corset. If your measurements change significantly, this can obviously be a little bit more tricky. A bib front regency gown is going to be super forgiving though because the bib generally pins in place and you have cross straps underneath that and so that can fit a pretty wide range of measurements. Likewise, an 18th century gown that pins close over a stomacher is also going to be very forgiving. One trick that I've learned through theater for anything that closes with the use of hooks and bars is that if you wind up losing a little weight, like up to about one to one and a half, maybe two inches or so, you can actually use safety pins as your bars. From the inside of the garment, have just a little bit of the safety pin showing on the outside 
about the width of a bar and make a row of these safety pin bars to correspond with your hooks. Ta-da! Super easy method to temporarily take in a garment that closes with hooks and eyes. I've done this with Victorian bodices and even like skirts that I wear every day and it works super super well. I had one person specifically ask about undergarments with weight fluctuations and honestly I would say that that's kind of the great thing about corsetry. Corsets and stays will still work just fine with a lacing gap or with no lacing gap. So you can have about a six inch range where your corsets and stays will still fit you pretty well. A corset with bust cups like a Regency corset is going to be a little bit less forgiving, but otherwise just make sure you never get smaller than the size of your corset or stays when laced closed and you should be pretty much fine. With petticoats and other things like that, just safety pin them, you know, like as long as you have a little tab extra. I've got one petticoat that it is open, I swear, this much on the side, but because the tab is longer, I just safety pin it and I've been using it for years and who really cares? And if you get smaller, just safety pin it on, um, you know, smaller than your hook and bar. I thought these next questions were kind of interesting because they appear to come from people who want to support and help their plus size friends and wanted to know what they could do better or what hardships plus size customers and sewists might face that straight sized people don't. For example, one person asked what I find most frustrating as far as lack of availability to plus size customers that non plus size customers might just take for granted. <sighs> Obviously, I think there are a lot of frustrations for plus size customers. From things like many pattern companies not making patterns large enough to jewelry makers not making necklaces long enough to fit larger necks or stockings not fitting larger calves or even shoes that are not available in larger sizes or wider widths. The most frustrating for me though and one that I've yet to find any sort of solution for is long opera length gloves for plus size arms. So if any of you know of any accessory sources that fit well for plus size people, and I mean gloves or otherwise, please do leave those links down in the comments. Similarly, another person asked how best to support their plus size sewing friends in the challenges that they face. And honestly, other than being a helpful fitting buddy, I'm not sure that there's a way to best support people in their sewing, but I know that for me, when smaller or mid-sized people are constantly talking about dieting or losing or gaining weight, I just want to yell at them to shut up. <laughs> so please keep that in mind when you're hanging out with your plus size friends, whether or not you're sewing, because talk like that can be very triggering and very annoying. The next question was asking about making 1930s shapewear and what fabrics would work best. I've never made 1930s shapewear and honestly I don't plan to because I feel that the 1930s is one of the least plus size friendly eras. But from looking at ads and such, the girdles that stout women wore, which is what they called plus size women then, were honestly pretty close to corsets. Most seem to be a mixture of like canvas and elastic paneling, lacing panels, boning, a busk of some sort, etc. In fact, I actually own what I believe is a 1920s corset for a stout woman and I think it might be fun to take a look at that in my antique examination video next week. So do be sure again to be subscribed and click that notification bell so that you are notified when that video is released as well. Speaking of corsets, I was asked what can you do when you have arthritis or anything else that makes back lacing on a corset difficult or painful? Personally, I would rig your corset for fan lacing and get someone to help you with fitting it while you're making it. American Duchess has a blog post about how to set your corsets up for fan lacing, so I am linking that blog post down in the description. That way you need only pull from the front and not have to worry about the back. I would also pair it with a separating busk like Victorian corsets have and use that busk no matter what era you're making just to make things a bit easier for yourself so that you don't have to like struggle to get them over your head. Even if you're working on an era where busks like that haven't been invented yet like Regency or 18th century or something like that. The next question reads, I admire how confident you are with tightly fitted bodices. As a plus size woman, I'm so used to a looser fit. Did it take you a while to get comfortable with the idea of well-fitted costumes? Honestly, not at all. Corsets are so wonderful to hide behind. They smooth everything out and they nip in your waist and so personally, 
I've always wanted to show that off in my costumes. So that is one of the reasons why I do like bodices that are really quite fitted. Next up is a two-part question. How do you take flattering photos in unflattering silhouettes? And how do you put yourself out there even when you know you'll get criticism? Let's start with part one of this question. I'm actually planning on doing a whole other video on how to take good photos, and I'm also hoping to teach that class at Costume College this year, so I'm not going to go into too much depth here, but basically, if you're worried about the actual silhouette of the costume, then you'll want to just work on your angles. Maybe try turning a bit to the side or keeping your arm just a little bit away from your waist so that you can get that visual definition. But honestly, the real responsibility here lies with the photo taker and not so much with the subject. As for the second part of this question, who the heck is it that is criticizing you? You do not deserve to be around negative people like that. No one should be criticizing you or judging you. I don't care what your skill level is, what you look like, or anything like that. If there are people around you that are tearing you down like that, you need to get away from those people. If those people are your friends, then newsflash, they're not your friends. If those people are your family, talk to them and tell them you do not appreciate any comments like that. And honestly, if they persist, you probably shouldn't be around them either. And if those are random people online, then just be liberal with the block and delete buttons because you deserve better. Likewise, this next submission was not so much a question as it was something that I want to draw attention to. One of you messaged me to say, as a male, I enjoy dressing up as female in cosplay and historic clothing, but I often get ignored when asking for help to make them. I believe that anyone can and should dress however they like, including male presenting people in traditionally female clothing or female presenting people in traditionally male clothing. It saddens me that people would ignore or be rude to anyone, no matter how they're dressed. So if you see someone asking for help on a project and you know how to help them, I really hope that you will offer that person your help no matter what gender they identify with and no matter what they're intending to make or to wear. Getting back to slightly lighter questions here though, are there any ways to modify a smaller dress form to better represent you? You can actually pad out your dress forms. There are companies that actually make pads for dress forms, but honestly, you can do it just by wrapping batting in the right place around the dress form. And then I recommend making a cover for it that will help to hold all of that batting in place. Red Threaded has a good video on their channel about this, so I will link that down below in the description. It does get a little more difficult if you're needing to increase the length of your dress form, but it is still doable. I was also asked what the best resource is for plus size historical undergarments, either patterns or ready to wear pieces. For patterns, check out Truly Victorian and Laughing Moon, like I mentioned earlier. For pre-made, I don't have any resources except for corsets, but I know that Red Threaded does make larger sized corsets and they sometimes do custom corsets as well. A specific question regarding petticoats was, I really like how petticoats look with history bounding. How do you wear a petticoat so that your skirts look fuller, but make sure that they don't make you look fuller? The main thing is to make sure that you don't have any bulk from your petticoats around your waist. You want that floof to start more like at your hips and go out from there. I personally love the Malco Modes Melanie petticoat for my daily wear, which I am linking down in the description. They have very thin stretchy material around the waist and tummy with just thin but sturdy elastic at the waist, but they're still quite full around the bottom, particularly when they're new. And if you mean more like Victorian style petticoats, just go with a rather lightweight waistband, just made like out of your petticoat fabric, or you could even just use sort of a tape as your waistband so that it won't add bulk to your waist. Petticoats are not the time to interface your waistbands. Lastly, I did have a couple of you asking for recommendations for people who take commissions for larger sizes. And I don't think that I know of anyone who currently takes historical commissions at all, so I'm appealing to you all as viewers. If you do take commissions for larger sizes, or if you have gotten clothes commissioned from someone that you recommend, please do comment that information below so that all of the rest of you can find those resources. Anyway, thank you all so much for sending me your questions, and I hope that this 
video was helpful for you. I did get quite a few questions that did not focus on plus size sewing, so I will likely do a general costuming and sewing Q&A sometime in the next couple of months and answer those questions then. In other words, if you have any sewing questions, whether that's for plus sizes or not, please do leave them in the comments so that I can try to address them in the future. If you liked this video though, please make sure to click the thumbs up icon, and if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. I do post videos here on YouTube twice a week, with my sewing vlogs out on Tuesdays and other costuming content like this out on Saturdays, but I post every day over on my Instagram, so please go follow me on Instagram, that's at Lady Rebecca Fashions. And if you'd like to help support all of the work that I do on this channel, I do have a link to my Patreon and my Ko-fi down in the description below. I'd also like to give a special shout out to my awarding level patrons, Sharon and Julie. Thank you all so, so much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful week, and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing!